Good morning, everyone. Um, um, today is a special day. We are uh, entering into the tritium. And um, uh, good morning to everybody in India, but there are people from other places. So some of us, uh, I am um, on a Wednesday night awaiting these, uh, you know, awaiting tritium to start. Um, and it is a special moment for me. I was very excited that I would be sharing uh, the word uh, you know, and this is happening for the first time in my life, and I was very excited about this, and this could have only come up uh, from the Lord. And uh, uh, I sincerely pray, and I want you all to pray that whatever comes out of my word, of my mouth and, and my thoughts from my heart, that they may be God's words speaking to myself and each one of us. Um, um, it, it, it's a it's a very uh, special occasion and uh, you all uh, we all uh, you know sang in tongues and it's uh, so special there must be um, you, you know i can imagine um, the angels singing um, but today uh, you know i also want to start uh, my session uh, you know as we contemplate this uh, um, with a little song i'm going to share my slide i've put up uh, the words this song uh, the moment I heard a couple of years ago, it, it's a beautiful song. It's it's called Little Things with Great Love. Um, it's a song that speaks about uh, God's love for us. And it also uh, speaks about how important we are to God. And it's especially important uh, when more than 2000 years since we are sitting here and because we know the events that happened um, during those three days, you know, whether we can, if those, if those situations present to us uh, today, um, will we do something different uh, with Jesus? You know, uh, that's something, uh, you know, that came to my mind as I was contemplating about this. Um, I'm going to sing this song. Um, uh, you guys sing beautifully, but if you do not know, uh, I will. If you want to sing, you can sing with me. Or uh, it is basically a meditation that will lead to whatever we are going to present. Just give me a second as I share the screen. In the garden of our Savior, no flower grows unseen. His kindness rains like water on every humble sea. No simple act of mercy escapes his watchful heart. For there is one who loves me, his hand is over mine. Oh, the deeds forgotten. Oh, the works unseen, every drink of water flowing graciously, every tender mercy you're making glorious. This you have asked us to little things with great love. This you have asked us to little things with great love. At the table of a Savior, no mouth will go unfair. His children in the shadows 
stream in and raise their heads. Oh, give us years to hear them and give us eyes to see. For there is one who loves them. I am his hands and feet. Oh, the deeds forgotten. Oh, the works unseen. Every drink of water flowing graciously. Every tender mercy you're making glorious. This you have asked us, do little things with great love. This you have asked us, do little things with great love. I'm sure every day we are inspired to do many things and hope that as we have gone through this Lent and contemplated, reflected and done something or the other, that we could commemorate, we could repent, we could reconcile, we could connect back with Jesus this Lent. And as we enter into the moment of Shridium, we could do things, little things with great love because his hand is over me and I am his hands and feet. So today, the theme that kept coming back to me was a story that I heard in a sermon 10 years ago. Uh, you know, um, a priest get, told this particular story uh, in a sermon during Lent and it's remained uh, in my mind, all the time, it was very inspirational. That's why 10 years since, I can remember the story as he told it. And the story was about walls and bridges. And this is the theme that I want us, that God wants us to think about. You know, um, we all live... Um, inside walls, our homes have walls. We feel very secure in those walls. And there are places that we cannot reach that we need bridges. So what are the walls and bridges that we are talking about? What we are talking about are the walls that we build around ourselves wherein we block from God. And the bridges that God wants us to build so that we can reach others and him. So that's where we see that we need this cross, this supreme sacrifice on Good Friday that could help break those walls that we have built within us, outside of us, between us and with others. And that we can use this example, this example of the supreme sacrifice of love and build bridges for God's sake, for Jesus' sake, so that his sacrifice is worthy. So the story I want to tell, so the story goes like this. There was a family. The, there was a dad. He had two sons. And um, they were all married. They had children. But they lived in the same house and they were all happy everything very good happening and they were all kind to each other loving each other and so on one fine day dad dies so the sons decide that you know uh, uh, th there was another house that the dad had built uh, just behind and um, in between the two houses there was a stream running so they decided that you know they would, uh, you know, each one of them will live uh, in each of those houses. So the 
older brother stayed back in the house that the dad lived, whereas the younger brother moved over to the other house. And as time went on, certain misunderstandings started coming in um, between them and resentment came, fights came, misunderstandings came. So much so that they didn't want one fine day to even speak with each other. So each of the brothers want their children that they do not want to see them mixing with the children of the other brother. They told their wives not to interact and so on. So there used to be a lot of skirmishes that used to happen between these two brothers all the while. They were angry with each other and there was no love in between them anymore. And one fine day, the older brother got tired because what used to happen was he would not go behind because he was so angry that when he went to the back of his house, he would see the house of his older brother and he didn't want anything to do, even see his house or see him. Or so it, so it grew so much. So he decided he is going to build a wall, you know, between his house such that that wall would prevent him from the sight of his brother and his family. So he called, uh, he, he went, he looked into his directory, he called a, person, a mason and said, you know, I, I have a job. Uh, do, uh, do you want to come and uh, help me out with the job? So somebody came. Um, knocked on the door, came in. So this uh, older brother went and showed this person uh, on the back door and he, he told him exactly what he wanted. He said, I want you to build a huge wall over here. It's perfect. And the main point that he said was that the wall should be so high that if I come to the back door of my house and open that door, I should not see beyond the wall. And he went in and he did his scores and uh, he thought that the mason was doing his job, so he never went behind. So this mason went ahead and uh, happened to start the job. When he had finished his job, he came to the, to, to the older brother and he said, I've done my job, so you can go and see it and uh, then decide how much to pay so that I can go on with my journey. So the older brother said, okay, okay, you stay over here. And he said, he's going to go behind. And when he went to the door and he opened the door, he found a bridge that was connecting the two. I told you that there was a stream between the houses. And what this mason had done was he had actually built a bridge instead of the wall. The older brother was extremely angry with what was happening. Now this job had taken days and, you know, and, Therefore, he was extremely angry. This is not the job that he had asked the mason to do. So he was so angry, but something stopped him. He saw that his younger brother started walking towards him and his family started walking towards him over the bridge. And, his young, and before he could fathom what was happening, his younger brother came, knelt down and said, sorry. Now, the older brother saw this and was moved and he hugged him and they reconciled. The reason was this, the younger brother was also angry. He didn't know what the older brother had seen and he found that the bridge was being built. So he realized that he was so angry and he was so, you know, he was being foolish and he was not being kind. And he could see that it was the love of the younger brother, older brother that he had asked to build a bridge. So he decided that he was sorry and he had to reconcile with the older brother and that's why he walked over the bridge. So immediately the older brother realized what was happening, his mood changed and he ran to find this mason who had done this and he found that he had gone. And the preacher, the priest told that the person who had come there, he was connecting that person was Jesus. So he could see in this story, how in our lives, we build a lot of walls. But Jesus, his idea for us is always to build those bridges and how to break them down. He wants us together. He wants the connection together. So I want to take go back to the two days. I'm not thinking about Easter yet. 
you know, my daughter kept asking me, hey, I'm going to plan this, this, this waste. And I said, no, no, no. There's an important thing. We'll talk it on the Saturday. Let's talk about Monday, Thursday and Good Friday because there's something more that we need to hold on to. So let's see about these walls and, and bridges in, the, in these two days from the Gospels. You know, so the day before the sacrifice, three important events and you know today is Monday Thursday in uh, India three things happen that uh, are very important about this day that Jesus did number one he gathered all his disciples and uh, for a meal but before that he went to wash their feet and he was showing them a very important example of uh, 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 in this story. Imagine your teacher, your master, and these disciples previously had already proclaimed that he was God. Peter had told multiple times, you are the son of God. And here he is with a towel in his hand and a bucket in his hand and he's washing the feet of his own disciples. And is setting an example and is also telling them, do as I have done this. How difficult could this be for a human? But you could see that the God in human form has no hesitation to do this to the 12. Then he goes and there is this beautiful meal that he sets wherein he institutes the body and blood, wherein he shares the meal, institutes the Eucharist. But there's one very important and a beautiful thing here. Jesus knew that the person who would betray him was part of this 12. He exactly knew who he was. And he even hinted in his words. He had also hinted about this fact throughout uh, much before then this event even happened. So being God himself, he knew what was going to happen. He also knew who was going to do it. Now, we can imagine that if we as humans know that somebody is going to be doing a bad thing to us, either we'll run away from them or not let them come close to us. Definitely not call them for a meal. But here is Jesus even feeding this very person and hinting to this person that, hey, I know that somebody here is going to betray me. And if we see the person who is supposed to do this and we'll come to who he is and what he did, he does not acknowledge he lies, his deceit. He doesn't say, yes, I am he. You know, straightforward, no. He even has the gusto to even take the piece of bread that Jesus himself feeds and he even doesn't feel bad about the person whom he is about to betray that is, is going to let him feed. So it happens. So the breaking of bread. And then after this, Jesus goes to the garden. He doesn't go and say, let me have a nap. Tomorrow is going to be a bad day. He goes into the garden of Gethsemane and what he does is in prayer. Now, we know from the Gospels that Jesus was very anxious about this day. And Jesus even prays to God that can this not happen? But then he submits to the will of the Father. Very important. It is this prayer that allows him to be able to go through one of the worst days in his human form. That is Good Friday and whatever is going to happen to him. But he goes out. Now, you can see that he also invites his very good friends that he has selected for his mission to also pray with him. And in this picture, you can see that they're all asleep. They've had this lovely meal. They've had their own master wash their feet. And now it's time to take a nap, sleep. And... Jesus constantly prompts 
um, uh, them to pray, especially tells Simon that, you know, like you're going to betray me three times. And we know that Simon says, no, 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 I would rather give up my life for it. And he tells him that you need to pray not just for me, that I that I could have the strength to undergo it, but you could have to have the strength of what is going to come. But Simon is too sleepy. So there are two parts here, what Jesus does and what the other 12 do. And in each one of these parts, can we see our story? What do we do? And can we see what God wants us to do? You know, so this was the day before the sacrifice. Now we go to the day of the sacrifice, day of the supreme sacrifice. And here's a picture of how Jesus is crucified next to two robbers. And we'll come to that. And we also have him pierced at the art. So now we go in this theme to the wall. Where are the walls in this story, in this picture, or in these events, in this passion? So number one, we have Judas betraying Jesus. Is Judas was spent himself as a disciple, being with Jesus for more than for three years. Jesus has been training him. He has been going through everything. But he's the one who betrayed Jesus, not somebody. You know, it's a different story when somebody you do not know come and betray you. Here he was. He was, he was part of that close-knit family of his. And he's the one who betrayed him. Number two, Peter, the very night that he said that he is going to die and sacrifice himself rather than denying before the cock crew, Peter denies knowing Jesus, yeah. the wall. Third, we see in the Old Testament that God sets up a particular society with definitive rules to different people. And in them, where people were supposed to teach and ensure that God's commandments came true, that people kept the commandments so that they could guide them to do what is right by God. And one of them with most knowledge of this were the Pharisees. But the people who actually condemned Jesus were these people themselves, the Pharisees and the Jews. Fourth, Pilate. Pilate is another person who washes his hands of Jesus. He says, I do not find fault with him. He has the authority to release a person who doesn't have a fault, but Pilate doesn't do that. But when we look at Jesus' story, there is a contrast. Jesus accepts Father's will. He knows why he, the Father sent him. He has lived that life, done everything that his Father has asked of him. And we see multiple times that the Father opens up and he says, I'm so proud of him. Do as he tells. And in this case, again, Jesus accepts Father's will that he has to undergo this death so that we are redeemed, so that the human race is redeemed, so that we get the connection back to heaven, back to God the Father that was broken with Adam and Eve's sin. And Jesus died for our sins. So let's just go a little bit deeper about this as to what the wall was in each of these four, four people. Number one, let's took, look at Jesus. Jesus betrayed, Judas betrayed Jesus. But here are four simple points that we can see where Judas built the wall. Yes, it's very easy to say Satan came into him and this happened, but this didn't happen overnight. And Judas was, you know, we all have our own human intelligence. And Judas also was part of the people where Jesus had trained and sent them. He had seen the miracles. He himself had gone and done healings and miracles 
with the others. It's not said explicitly, but the disciples were sent out by Jesus before. But, and Judas has a very important role amongst the disciples. He was the money keeper. And in what he does in the finale, he chose money over Jesus. We can see in the in a few episodes, a week before these events happened, when Mary comes with very uh, with special oil, which was very costly, and is anointing Jesus, Judas stands up and says, "Which why are we wasting this oil? Um, we would rather sell it for money." And then, in a deceitful sense, to uh, qualify that point, he said, "You know, we could uh, then give the money over to the poor." And uh, there is clearly said that Judas was actually stealing money from uh, the treasury that they were having. Second, we can see that Judas's stuff is about, he has realized that Jesus is not the person, probably, and I, I guess this was true of Peter too, that, you know, the sense was to be powerful, to be with the power player who would be king in the human sense who would have authority over everyone and and you would have authority and do things and you can see that jesus is not doing that he is going amongst he is going amongst the poor is he is constantly in this humble uh, world and it seems like it's not making sense to judas so he chooses power over serving the downtrodden serving God's own people. And he chooses betrayal over loyalty. So we can clearly see his chosen flesh over the spirit. But what are the consequences of this? Did Judas gain anything from what he did? Well, he had to hang alone. Nobody with him. He had to commit suicide, die a dishonorable death. We can see that Judas realized his mistake when he, so it's probable, and the way I, it came to me was, his idea was to give over Jesus. He thought that Jesus would be punished in some way or the other. He wouldn't be killed, I guess. But then when he realized the brutality with which people were harming Jesus, he realizes that, you know, he has handed over a person who is completely blemishless. And he goes back, he goes back to the people with whom he made that deal. And we can see what those people did. They, did, they said, we are not going to have anything to do with you. The deal's done. The deal's done in our lives. When we go the wrong way, we cannot take it back. So whatever has to happen, there'll be a lot of temptations. Whatever has to happen, has to happen before we act. Judas is acted. Second, the person to whom he goes and repents is to the Pharisees. He goes and tells them, look, I've handed over the wrong person to you. He has done nothing wrong. Let's re go back on the deal. And let's get back to the situation that was before all this happened. But they don't agree. Now, I always think, what would have happened if Jesus went, uh, I mean, if Judas went to Jesus? Wouldn't, wouldn't Jesus have you know, uh, taken him back, you know, like, wouldn't he have forgiven? It's a beautiful question, but Judas didn't have the courage and the foresight to do that. And therefore, he died this dishonorable death alone. So bottom line with Judas, money could not save him. And we do not, we know him, we do not want to have anything to do with Judas. But we can look at the lives around how the world is going on. Isn't money the most important thing in many people's life? That, and Jesus, the back burner. So this is something that we need to contemplate. Second, Peter, one of the most favorites. And um, Peter is somebody who is like very outspoken, most outspoken of the disciples. He's very instant with very good answers. And is always ready. But we see that, you know, like he falls. There is nothing different between the sin of Judas and the sin 
of denial of Peter, he also sinned. In fact, he says his own proclamation that Jesus is the son of God, when he's asked, you were his friend, you were with him, his whole thing was to deny. Jesus. You know, deny knowing Jesus. Now we can see why he did it. You can see he was arrogant to state straight to Jesus that he would not deny him but die. Didn't understand son of God knew it. He knew that he was God. God knows more. So he, he must have reflected over what was going to happen. And if he'd done that and been obedient, he wouldn't have slept when Jesus invited him to pray at Gethsemane. Then he would have probably through that prayer built that courage to say, yes, I know Jesus. I am with him. But we can envisage that in our humanness, that we cannot be what God can do. So Peter was afraid. We can give it to him that he was afraid of how brutal and violent the crowd was. So we can see that he chose his own life over saying, accepting that he knew Jesus. There's a difference between what Judas did versus Peter did. Peter, even though he runs away, when he recognizes that whatever Jesus said came true, he remained, he ran away, but he remained with the other disciples and Mother Mary until Jesus found him again after resurrection. So while Judas built a big wall without a window and he climbed the wall and jumped off it, Peter built a wall, but he built a wall with a window. So he at least had the window so that he gave an opportunity for himself later on so that Jesus could find him and redeem him. And we can see later on after resurrection, the Easter story of Jesus finding Peter and redeeming Peter and establishing him as a rock on which our church is built. This also brings to the point of important community is many times we fall and we are all brothers and sisters. We need each other when we fall and you know, and when we are not doing, there can be situations where we do not have things in our power. You can see in Peter's story that it came true. He was able to, he had extreme grief about what he had done, but his company was what kept him, that prayer, that Mother Mary in the center, that later on he was able to redeem and reconcile and repent. Then we go to the Pharisees. Now, these Pharisees had become powerful. They were supposed to be powerful with regard to emphasizing how God wanted them. But we see that they became, they remained powerful, but became blinded. They were powerful from the social sense, from the money sense. They were judgmental. We can see that there's a constant strife and constant conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus, they, they, were felt, they felt guilty about it when he preached. And they constantly wanted to show that Jesus was wrong. They were trying to catch him wrong. And the reason why Jesus, God had to send Jesus at all, his son of man, to come here and through and through was because the people who were supposed to help the community obey the commandments were not doing it with love and spirit. And that's very important with whatever we do. And that was missing. These guys were greedy. They wanted to stick to the power. The power was important for them. And one of the reasons why they conspired against Jesus was they knew that if they didn't do it at this time, then the power would go out of their hands and they wouldn't be able to live the lives that they were living with authority from a social sense. Their hearts were closed, their minds were closed. So people whom God wanted to teach God's word and reflect God's judgment with compassion, they ended up judging Jesus himself, God himself, and condemning God to death. As we all 
look at Pontius Pilate and we'll come to him later. But the main point is that God's own people were the ones who judge the Son of God and condemned him to death. And that's the reality. Now we come to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate allows things to happen with Jesus and to be put to death, even though he himself reveals that he doesn't, he knows that he's innocent. And that's for a very important reason. And we can see some of us, some of our stories, sometimes our situations are like this. He was caught between satisfying the Jews and Caesar or standing by the truth. And he realized that his world would change to the worse from the human sense if he stood by the truth. And therefore, it was fine for him to satisfy the Jews and Caesar. So we can see these kind of situations are complete all the time around us in our life. And we are constantly caught up in this question about whether we should stand by the truth or we should satisfy something from human sense that we think is power. And most of the times we stand back. So here's the time for us to reflect. Can we stand by the truth? Knowing that Jesus would help us out. Knowing that God, as long as God's hand is on us, will be fine. He will help us to reach the cause. So the day of sacrifice, we've seen the walls. The people who built the walls, what they did. And what were the consequences of them? So the question is, where is the bridges in this story? So you'll be surprised, and this could be surprising, but this is something over the few years. Um, here are the three people who are the bridges. There are three saints in the story. Number one is Saint Dismas, the thief on the right, who is a saint. Number two, St. Longinus, the centurion who pierces Jesus' heart and proclaims that he's God, is a saint. Number three, a Pharisee, St. Nicodemus, the one who came in the night to talk to Jesus, is the one who accepted Jesus as the king, is the one who shows us on this day, on Good Friday, when these things happened, in those moments, the ones who broke down their walls were able to build the bridges. Let's look at this story in brief. And it's really fascinating. The first story is the story of two robbers, Dismas and Gesmas, on either side of Jesus. And you can see Jesus is helpless and he's about to die. There's no doubt about it. One challenges him that if he is God, you save yourself and save us. Why are we dying on the cross? One of the robbers. But the other one rebukes him and requests Jesus that he would remember him. Beautiful song. Jesus, remember me. And what does Jesus do? He says, before the next day, you will be with me. In paradise, Jesus himself accompanies Dismas to paradise, a robber all his life. His story was written by a German mystic, blessed uh, Anne Catherine Emmerich in a, one of the books called as Dolores, Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ. It was very interesting when I dug it. The story is a put Dismas and Dismas. Their profession was robbery. From their childhood, they were, they were, they came from bands of robbers who were at the border of Israel and Egypt. So basically, they lived through robbery. And it seems that the only family, once on a journey, had got exhausted and taken refuge in a cave, which happened to be the home of Dismas, who was a little boy. And his mom had granted hospitality to the Holy Family. Now, Dismas in his young had leprosy. 
but he was instantly healed or cleansed when he was dipped in the water that was used to bathe infant Jesus. So the charity of his mother was rewarded by the cure of her child, but then did not do anything to dismiss. He grew up to be a robber, and that is why he was being crucified next to Jesus for his act of robbery. Beauty about what happened. Christmas had his heart open. So he could see that Jesus was not like him. And he did not deserve to be up there next to him. Being crucified. And he had the wherewithal and the courage to accept Jesus as he was. He recognized Jesus there. What did he get? Instant salvation. So it is not that we have to undergo, with respect to Jesus, it's not that we have to undergo this repentance of years and years. It's all about our heart, all about opening up our eyes and heart to him and giving ourselves to him. He is instant, it's instantly ready to accept. And this we see about and Longinus, and Longinus is called as a centurion in the story. There's a line that we read every Good Friday in the Gospels, but we pass through it. We do not wait and reflect. And this story is not very relevant. Nobody preaches about this. But he is a centurion who pierced the side of Jesus to find whether he was still dead or alive. So how did he become a saint? So the story goes, that St. Longinus was nearly blind. And when blood and water flowed out of the heart of Jesus, splashed onto his eyes and he was healed. And he could instantly see that Jesus was Lord because there was a miracle. He was able to see clearly. And there goes this proclamation. Indeed, this was the Son of God. But did he stay on their seat? This Longinus or the centurion, he was the leader of the uh, of the troop of soldiers who were supposed who actually were responsible for what Jesus was going through on this Good Friday. They were the ones who were leading him from place to place, scourging, beating, etc., etc. He was the leader. He was because he was under the Roman Empire, and but he did these bad acts. So when he saw these miracles, you told he left everything, left the army, and he went away into the wild. And you told in one of the stories that in, 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 the, in other stories, it is written that he went to the apostles and became a monk in Cappadocia. Now the people is uh, people did not like because he now started proclaiming Jesus is Lord. This is not what the Pharisees or the Romans wanted. You know, they did not want resurrection. They didn't want, want Christ as God. So they bade because he was very important because here was a big conversion, an amazing testimony. So the governor, uh, you know, like he was arre arrested for his faith and he's brutalized. His teeth were forced out and tongue was cut off, it said. But Longinus, miraculously continued to speak clearly and he destroyed several idols in the presence of the governor. Now it so happened that the cover, so when Longinus was beheaded, when his blood splashed onto the governor who was also blind, his eyes were opened up. So you can see that it's an amazing story and there are multiple stories about Longinus. And you can see that this remarkable event wherein he pierces Jesus, his blood flows off, and he is miraculously healed. Now he encountered, converted, and now he's proclaiming Jesus. And you can see that he himself is a miracle because now through him, the purity, the holiness is flowing out and is healing others through him. And that's the beauty about the saints. But 
in this story, we can see when we break down those walls and build those bridges, no matter how bad those walls were, how bad we are, you can see how God can redeem and how marvelous deeds can happen through people who are touched by God. The third was Pharisee. We can see that Pharisees played a central role in the death of Jesus because of their blindness, but not this one man, Nicodemus. So Jesus' death is undergone. There's nobody around who comes to honor him and put him in the tomb after his death. Joseph of Arimathea, who is another wealthy person, and Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, he's also a very important member of the Sanhedrin. He comes out. He is at complete risk. He has complete risk of his own status, but because at the time, if you went against the Sanhedrin, you lost everything, all your status, et cetera, et cetera, and you were outcast. And Nicodemus takes that chance. You know why? Because in that encounter that he had early on, where he went out in the night in the darkness and he spoke to Jesus and Jesus spoke about being born again in the spirit. We can see that Nicodemus comes out in the spirit in an episode where he did not have to come out. But we can see the conversion that has gone into him, how he has accepted Jesus over everything else, the social status, be it his power, whatever. And what he did, and how does he profess this? He brings, as seen in John, he brings a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds, and he takes Jesus' body, wraps it with spices and stripes of linen, and, in a, and he is buried in accordance with the Jewish burial custom. So he's revered. He, he, he is given an honorable burial. And with regard to Nicodemus, the myrrh and aloes that he brought, they signify that he accepted Jesus as the king. So he, God as the king. So we can see a complete conversion of uh, this man. So these three stories, these three characters, completely characters on that day, on the day of Good Friday, when Jesus' own people, one had betrayed him, one had denied him, the others had run away, there was nobody around. And we can see that the three people who turned out, one was a thief, the other one was the one who pierced him, and the third was the member of the Sanhedrin that had actually condemned Jesus to death. And we can, in these three examples, we can see how an encounter with Jesus, recognizing Jesus, we can break down those walls, we can see what happens. Each one of these three are proclaimed saints by the Catholic Church. And there are a lot of, they, 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 there are a lot of stories which are not in the Gospels, but there, there are other books and things that are recorded. We even have a Gospel of Nicodemus um, and, and things like that, wherein many of the events are uh, recorded. We can see that how Jesus touched the lives, not only of those who were close to him and things like that, but on that day. And the most important thing is that even after his death, we can see that he still performed miracles. That can only be God himself. So, how can we, um, so finally, how can we have this message of freedom? What's the message of freedom in this contest after hearing all this? And it should not remain just for this freedom. It should proceed further, small steps. The small step is to stop building walls and start tearing down those walls that we've built, whatever that wall could be. Leave it to Jesus. You can see in small ways wherein it didn't take much. It didn't take too many words. It just requires a realization and acceptance and the walk. And God 
would do it for you. Therefore, let's start building bridges yesterday. So this is where I will stop with this message. And um, I hope that this will be a beautiful, a very blessed, a very hopeful uh, tritium uh, for each and everybody. And I hope that we will constantly um, not only keep this message to ourselves, but be able to touch others uh, also. Why I say this uh, is also because, you know, like, um, because we have a few more minutes. I want to share one thing. We had a, we, 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 a few of us participate. We participated in a Lenten retreat uh, for youth. We uh, were the resources. And when I went to that retreat, uh, there were at least 50 kids um, of all ages. There were about 25 uh, who were high schools and college kids. And we could see that many of them questioned being Christian, had no idea about who Christ was, who Jesus was, why they were Christians, except for the fact that their parents were Christians. They'd come to the retreat just because they were dragged to the retreat. I just wanted to spend their time. We did see two, two kids, two out of 25, who had that spirit chiming. And that opened my eyes to the fact that it's not enough for me to just pray inside and keep to myself and to my home because there's a crowd outside of us, probably in our own families, that we need to help them to be able to also break down the walls and build bridges. And we need to do this not only for their uh, salvation, but in order so that we can commemorate and we could respect and we could, we could acknowledge and we could revere the supreme sacrifice that Jesus did on that Good Friday and continues to do that um, as we live. Thank you so much for uh, the patience to listen. And um, have a blessed day. Thank you, brother. Thank, Thank you, me. brother Anthony. That was a beautiful talk and the tridium today. You're welcome. We Thank you so much. Brother Anthony. Thank you so much, Thank brother. brother. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, Thank brothers you. and sisters. Thank you, brother Anthony. Thank, Thank you, you so brother. much. We went into so much of depth. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Praise God. Praise God. So I hope you will all have a wonderful tritium that will lead to Easter and a resurrection. <laughs> Thank Amen. you, brother. And same Thank to you, you and your family you. as well. Yeah. Sure. Wish you the same, brother. Thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, come willingly accepted our invitation for today and meet for us. Thank you so much for the God bless you and your family abundantly. Thank you very much. Keep us in prayers and I'll, sure. and this is a beautiful group and I hope you know we'll keep talking to each other. Sure, brother, we'll you are all others. you are you and your family are every day in our prayers. Yes, thank you. Only until Jesus comes back. Yes. yes. <laughs>